system, you all end up paying. With Mojo Nation, we keep score. We say that we will create a currency, these digital coins that are denominated in computational resources. So every unit of this currency that we call Mojo represents a floating basket of goods, CPU time, disk space, bandwidth. It's merely a means for people to say, my particular resource is worth X, yours is worth Y, let's trade. On top of this basic coin system, we had microcredit. Now, microcredit means that peers can establish relationships with other peers without having to necessarily trust them. You start off and you say, I'll give you 100 mojo of credits, and you'll give me 50 mojo of credit, perhaps, because I have a worse credit rating. And then we will begin to conduct transactions without having to actually exchange coins yet. Until the balance between us moves outside of the existing credit range, you don't have to send a coin. So it's very lightweight in terms of the demands placed on the token server. And it also means you can't watch the bank to see what's, what people are doing within the system. Now the distributed data service that we build on top of this basic micropayment system is a pure information market. Independent agents trying to buy and sell services to each other. We start off with a simple secure message passing system. Just encrypted messages going from one public key to another, asynchronous messages that can run straight over HTTP, any transport protocol you'd like. And on top of that, we build this data content and distribution system. It's decentralized. There's no center to this system. It's a bunch of independent agents, all basically trying to buy and sell services with each other. So if what people think of as the top or the center of the system disappears, the market continues. The market will just keep going on. People will find new parties to exchange data with. The system is also self-organizing in that it doesn't require a central server to tell you, here's what, where things are. And the way that Napster has its index servers and certain other systems may have key nodes. In our system, every agent picks a particular task that it will do and then tries to optimize its performance of that task to earn more mojo. The system itself is also very fault tolerant. Because we're dealing with simple messages, we don't care if one or two of them gets lost. We can always retransmit other messages to different agents. And it's very cheap and easy for you to send multiple agents to people and decide, well, I'll take whoever answers this request faster. The system itself will also scale up to a large number of users and also to high bandwidth content. So Mojo Nation, as it stands right now, well, without even trying, we can stream, well, with a little buffer, we can stream audio. The video is a short step away. The system is designed so that when data is published, it's split up into lots of pieces, sent out to thousands of systems, and then when you want to download a particular piece of content, you send a small bit of data through your small upstream pipe to another user who sends the small bit of data that you're requesting down their upstream pipe. Now, because most people end up having asynchronous connections, they can download a little bit more than they can upload, we end up with a situation where we can create, we can actually send as much data as you can handle on your downstream pipe without overly taxing all of the upload capacities of the various people who are sending you these bits. So if you want to publish a, a file in Mojo Nation, you start off with your original file, you break it up into a sequential series of splits. Each of these splits you run through a standard error correction algorithm and generate eight shares of the original block. Any four of these eight shares are sufficient to reconstruct the original piece of data, and there's no loss of efficiency. Those four pieces of data, the four shares to the block, are equivalent in size to the original block. So you take each of these redundancy shares and you run them through SHA-1 and you generate a unique 160-bit tag for every number, or for every block. You then create a map. Now this map is basically the instructions on how do I reconstruct this file given this pile of blocks with these particular SHA-1 addresses. You then take this share map and you run it through the system again and you end up with eight SHA-1 numbers that uniquely identify any piece of content within this system. So a URL in Mojo Nation is actually just one long number. That's it. It gets you to the data no matter where it happens to be stored. Now 
once you've prepared this file for publication, you go out and you look for people who you can pay to hold on to that block temporarily. Basically, these servers act as a, temporarily, a temporary staging area where you place a block and you notify the rest of the world, hey, there's new data within the system. It's a little bit more efficient than that, but basically you send off a message to all of the block servers that may be interested in that range, and you say, you can get this block here, and because it covers your range, there's a particularly good chance you'll be able to resend this, resell this to somebody else later. Now, in addition to all of these blocks, you have a chunk of metadata, a little XML blob that describes what the content is, perhaps a signature for the, public, the person publishing it if they wish to establish reputation as somebody who publishes good stuff or accurately labeled things. And you send this metadata to our trackers. Now, the block servers within this system are agents that you run to resell your local disk space and bandwidth to move the messages move messages that people have regarding give me this particular bit. So if you're sitting on a very large chunk of disks and a little bit of bandwidth, you'll be able to resell parts of that disk space to the Mojo Nation system. Now every block server picks a random mask within this 160-bit address space and says, I will handle blocks, I will buy and sell blocks that happen to match this particular mask. These block servers then advertise this fact to the rest of the network. And when somebody wishes to retrieve a block, they have their own list of who do I trust that handles this part of the address range. And they go and they ask that server, have you got a copy? If they don't have a copy, then you check your map of who you know that covers what, and you go and ask another person and another person until you find the data. Now, the more requests you send out, you're also generating information within the market. There's somebody looking for this data. So the data itself, as it gets bought and resold within the system, actually tends to move to where users are consuming it. Now, once you pull in more and more blocks within the system, and a block server with a fixed amount of space eventually runs out of new places to store information, it gets to make a choice. Do I want to only keep the most popular things and still advertise a very wide address mask, or do I want to shrink my address mask and instead hold things for depth and generate a reputation as somebody who keeps a deep history in a particular part of the file system space? These are decisions that each individual broker and block server will be able to make depending on how the user wishes to configure it. So when you actually want to get a piece of data, you start off with this distributed inode. Either you got it via a content tracker lookup, or you just open a simple URL that describes this content. Now the first thing that happens is your broker looks for block servers and tries to figure out who it's going to buy these particular blocks that you're looking for. It then goes out onto the net and it tries to purchase these blocks in the market space. After it has four of the eight blocks, it runs it back through the decoder, and it keeps repeating this until you have actually rebuilt the entire file. Then this data is sent off to a local agent, whether that's your browser, it could be an image viewer. We're very independent as far as the types of content presentation methods we use. Somebody could easily hook up you know, a video streaming program to this and pull their data down using Mojo Now the content trackers, the other major agent within the system, are the kind of the catch-all category of everybody who keeps track of little bits of information about the state of the network, or at least their viewpoint on what the state of the network is. They serve as distributed search engines, so when you publish a bit of content, you send it off to trackers who cover that particular space. If you're publishing perhaps a pirated Metallica track, you would send that off to an MP3 tracker, and you would tell them, here's where it is, it's an MP3, so I know you're interested in it. And that is information that those content trackers will be able to later resell to other agents who are looking for a particular piece of music. The content tracker also handles directory services, so they'll tell you where you can find a particular agent, they'll tell you, well, at least they'll tell you where that particular agent is receiving their messages. They'll also tell you things like what the reputation of a particular agent is, they'll act as namespace managers, and they'll also perform certain filtering functions, so that if you wanted to retrieve data that was only published by somebody with a fairly high reputation for publishing the really good stuff, you could ask the content tracker and say, only give me those results that match this criteria. Now, Mojo Nation uses secure message passing and a bunch of other smart things to make sure that most of your activity within the system is 
untraceable or at least lost within the noise. Identities within the system are all established using public keys. Your public key is your identity within the system. We also are completely transport independent. We can run this over HTTP, and we actually do that right now. We can run this through ZKS Freedom, Web Mixes, Anonymizer. We don't care how you get the packets to and from locations. We just take the messages and we process them. The other agent that we have are relay servers. Now, these are servers that will perform a service on behalf of another user, in this case, passing of messages. So they're much like a Chaumian mix node. They'll take incoming messages, they'll decide who they have to go out to, and then they'll send them off. The other function they perform is a message drop, so that if somebody is trying to provide data to Mojo Nation behind a firewall, if they're trying to hide who it is that they are or where their server is located, they can contact a relay server and pay the relay server to advertise, I am a want to get to Jim. So I know what his public key is, he has told me where he is located currently, and I advertise this presence to the rest of the network. So that way, this agent then sits around and collects my messages, and I will occasionally check up with it and say, have you got any mail for me? Okay, give me those messages so that I can process them. This allows us to get a simple step of indirection, and then at later points, we'll be able to chain these relay servers together. We'll allow you to add in any sort of you know, anonymity providing transport function that will work for you. Reputations are another major system that we use within here, mostly as a means of telling an agent what is your current view of the world. Um, this includes information like, here's a list of everyone I've conducted a transaction with. Here's how many messages I sent to them, how many I expected to get in response, and how many I actually did get. So if somebody is trying to cheat you by, for example, accepting your money for the message and then not giving you the results, eventually the reputation will drop. In fact, it will drop quite quickly because you're just going to go to somebody else who will actually be able to perform that service for you. Reputations also control other types of cheating within the system. So if you try to post some content and mislabel it, well then eventually somebody is going to mark that particular description of the content as being inaccurate. And they'll say, give this person a thumbs down. What ends up happening is that you get an emergent view of the state of the network. No agent needs to trust any other agent. They only trust what they've actually experienced. Now, third-party servers can go and take this information, basically pay agents to send a copy of their reputation field, all of their reputation information, collate it all together, and then resell to other people what are effectively global reputations within the system. Now, some future functions that we're adding are based on the fact that we start off with a micropayment system. We have a means of moving funds from one person to another. That means you can leave a tip. You can download content. The content may have a registered publisher or somebody who actually created it saying, this is mine, give me a nickel. And we make it very easy. We'll add a simple button that you can say, send somebody five mojo, or five cents worth of mojo for that particular piece of content. It also means that within the system, because everything is monetized, you have the option of effectively dialing in the amount of privacy you want or quality of service. If you want to spend more, you can spend more and send your message through lots of different agents within the system to hide your identity. Or if you want to spend more for a better quality of service, you can send a little bit more payment with your messages and say, move me up in the queue. I'm more important than them and I'm willing to pay for it. So we can actually give you a little bit of quality of service based on this. In the future, we can also provide distributed computation services. Any online task that people want to do can easily be monetized and metered using Mojo. The other thing we'll be adding are hooks for streaming content, so that you'll be able to simply stream stuff, um, take any type of content you want, feed it straight into a viewer. So, in short, the market works. Throughout this system, we've always tried to, when we hit a sticky point, fall back and say, how does this work in the real world? How do untrustworthy parties move goods and services between each other? And, wherever possible, just rip off those ideas from the existing market. Now, the source is currently up on the URL there, and it's being hosted the development site. We are mirroring our source at SourceForge, um, the Mojo Nation project. That's where you can grab it. And otherwise, I'd actually like to jump into questions, because people have lots. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
publish anonymously within this system, uh, the publisher, uh, he asked two questions. One was, how do you move real money through the system? And the other was, how do you publish anonymously? The way that I'll kind of answer those in reverse order. The way that you publish anonymously is that you start off and you split your blocks up and then you pay people temporarily to just hold on to that data. All you're saying is, I'll pay you a little bit of mojo, hold on to it for a week. And I notify other agents that you have this new data. Now they expect to be able to resell this to others. So they'll contact you and they'll say, give me a copy of the block. Now at that point, that's the last time that anyone will ever know approximately who the publisher is. Now if the publisher is really paranoid, they'd have sent the data to that, uh, temporarily hold, that temporary holding server via another relay server or some means of indirection. But once the data is published, the publisher can disconnect. They're not involved anymore. The data is in the system. It's being stored on block servers, and the market is maintaining it. As long as there is a demand for those bits, they'll continue to exist within the system. It's like a huge, a huge cache that basically pairs off the least recently used members until we uh, have an actual matching of demand and supply. And so the other question was, how do you get the real money in and out of the system? Immediately during the beta period, you don't. As soon as we go into the actual release, the end of sep September, once RSA is free. Um, <laughs> yes. Waited a long time for that, so let me tell you. But um, basically, we will perform that function, and others can perform that function. A digital coin is a number. You could go sell it on eBay if you wanted. Clear with PayPal. We don't care. We will be a market maker in the currency, which means that if no one else will, will buy or sell your mojo, we will. Now, within the system, there are people who will be net producers of mojo because they've got more resources than they consume. And there are people who are net consumers of, research, of mojo because they, they're sitting on a dial-up line. They can't really serve much, but they really want all that content. What we will do is we'll match up the buyers and the sellers and take a small commission. If people want to you know, go around us, that's no problem. We're not, we claim no exclusive position within the system other than being a market maker. For a person that you can come to and know somebody will buy it or somebody will sell you it. So that's how we intend on moving money through the system. Is people who want to buy it will come and buy it from us and people who want to sell it will sell it to us. The actual identities, I should restate the, uh, the anonymity on that. The coins are anonymous. Well, they can be anonymous. When you withdraw the coin, it's an RSA op. Charmian blinding is a client-side operation, and the source code is out there. That's about all I can really say on the, the, the coin anonymity subject. But on the payment anonymity, we will know identities of people who put money in and take it out. But we lose track of it once it's in the system. They are literally numbers moving around. And our bank can't guarantee that you haven't blinded your coin when you sent it to us. So unfortunately, there are real regulations that the governments and many, every government has regarding needing identity for starting money systems. Um, that was one of the, the things that actually makes this kind of unique, is you can go in and you can actually start earning money and earning mojo without telling us who you are. You just start running a service, you start earning mojo, and only when you actually want to cash out, that's the only time you have to give us an identity. So there's a real low barrier to entry on the payment system. Yes, in the back. Option as far as other services that you can run on top of this, or the, the actual price of Mojo will float. Mojo is just a rep every unit of Mojo is just a representation of one small chunk of the total pool of resources available at any one point in time. So, as basically we've got things like Moore's Law slowly pushing the price down, the price of all of these resources is slowly dropping. The price of Mojo is just a derivative of the price of those resources. So as the cost of bandwidth goes down, as the cost of disk space goes down, and as CPUs get cheaper, the actual real price of Mojo will slowly drop. But will that, I think we're asking the question, will it be possible to figure out the more uh, after post-beta stage to be asked to purchase Mojo online? Yes. 
you'll be able to, to purchase Mojo online, you'll be able to sell us or send us checks or money orders, and we will write checks to you. Yeah. Those who will earn the most mojo are those who can most compete effectively within the system. So if you can, you go back to, you have a raw set of services that you can offer to people. You will try to resell those and earn some mojo. So those who are sitting on a big pile of, of bandwidth or disk space will be able to earn a lot of mojo. Those who are sitting on lots of bandwidth but not much disk space will be able to run relay servers. Those who have the disk space but not as much bandwidth can run block servers. Basically, users can decide according to the resources that they have available to them what servers they want to run that will be most you know, most effective at earning them mojo. Mm -hmm. I expect that to change over time. Initially, relay servers and content trackers. Now, as part of our legal strategy, we don't run content trackers. We can't put the pieces together. Only you can by running content trackers. Yeah. Uh, yes. cash. For starters, the beta mojo will be backed by $100,000 from our company. At the end of that period, you'll be able to take your beta mojo, convert it back for a pool of the total tokens that we've minted. After the beta, when it's actually in release, you're right, content trackers will always be a service in demand, and that those who want to run content trackers will be able to earn some money. And it is also the point of liability. If somebody actually wants to go after an agent within the system, that's the first place they'll start, because the content tracker this file system, you can't just walk the file system. You actually have to know what you're looking for before you can reconstruct the data. Now the content trackers can also live behind relay servers. It was explicitly designed, like right now, you can run a content tracker, you can hide it behind several relay servers, and they will advertise to the world, I am a way to get to Bob's content tracker, but still not necessarily know, am I the first part of the chain, am I the last part of the chain? We hope to make it very difficult for somebody to actually track down and not worth it if they ever go after it. We want them to come after us. Because we were smart and spent a year and a half talking to lawyers before we wrote any code. <laughs> necessarily jump in straight with money in the system or, or, who, or who don't want to pay. If you try to take advantage of the system, if you try to cheat other people, you're going to find, first of all, that your reputation is going to drop like a stone and no one is going to want to talk to you. Um, so basically what happens is you start cheating people. You start, say, taking their money and not answering their requests. One, they're going to stop talking to you. So you get basic banishment, which is the only punishment you can ever have in an informal society, is saying, we just won't talk to you. So at that point you say, well, I've used up this reputation, this identity, I'll burn it, and I'll start over again. So if you start over again with a new identity, you will have a lower credit rating, because that identity has not had much flow through the bank. 
and you'll also be somebody that no one else has heard of. So what they'll start off with is they'll offer you less credit, and they'll also, at some points, even charge you more, because they're taking a risk, even conducting business with you. It's the same sense of the real world. Some pe there are people who can't get good credit, but there are other people who are willing to loan them a little bit at high rates to pull them into the system. And that's what this does, is it basically says, if you want to avoid any cheaters, or at least want to really minimize cheaters, only talk to people who are trustworthy. If you want to earn a lot of money, take a risk and talk to people who have no reputation. I guess a small question. From this supply side, you know, it's kind of an offering or whatever kind of an offering reputation to a reliable or reliable service. At the moment, it's a real simple handicapping system, and it's based on price. Um, there is a, a business logic agent to this, which we expect all sorts of frustrated day traders to try to code to and say, I, I can think of a better way to run this agent, make decisions based on what I think the user wants. So you're, there is actually programmability to what can be done and how you make these economic decisions. The simple one right now is go for the best price. But you know, dig into the code and, and show us that there's a better way to do it. Yeah. two questions. One, the second question was how do you cherry pick, how do you prevent people from picking the popular content and, and avoiding the content that they, they don't think they're going to resell? Yeah, I feel like the whole monetary revenue and what is independent security. Independent security audit, we've had the code out to a small group of alpha testers at the moment and we've given it to a couple of people to look at. I don't, a deep audit is something we want. Ian is looking at it. Um, where we have David Chime on our board of directors, our board of advisors, so we've got a little bit there. But at this stage, we think it's good. The people we've talked to said, yeah, it should work, but nobody has really dug into the code at the, the, the fine grade level, the same way the PGP, for example, has been examined. We're actually hoping that people will do that now that the code is out there and available, and we will seek an independent audit of the code ourselves. Now, as far as how you can prevent people, one, you cannot prevent anyone from taking a piece of content in this system and doing whatever they want with it. You have no control over the information. When you put it out there, you're just saying, here it is, I hope that somebody likes it. Maybe it'll stick around, maybe it will disappear. Um, but what you're basically doing is throwing the content out there and hoping that somebody will come and buy it. Now, because the entire file system is this hash address space, you as an agent can't go and effectively pick what's the most popular stuff today because what's going to happen is the only way that you can ever get anyone to come and ask you for that information, the only way that you can resell that is if you have a, high, a reasonably high reputation at delivering what it is that people want. Um, when an agent starts off, a block server can say, I handle this part of the address space. Maybe I handle this, these eight bits in the mask. And then eventually they fill up and they have to decide what to do. Do I want to keep the most popular stuff, the things that I know that I can resell? Or do I want to narrow my mask and keep history in the parts that I do know? If you keep your mask set at a very large level, then what will happen is lots of people will come to you and say, oh, you advertise for this big address range. Here's a little chunk of it. Have you got a copy? Now, if you're only picking the most popular stuff, odds are you're not going to have a copy of it unless you've got a lot of disk. So what's going to happen is you're going to say, nope, sorry, I don't have it. And your reputation with that agent has now dropped a small fraction because they asked you for a piece of data and you didn't have it. So what happens to somebody who tries to cherry pick that sort of data and they don't have the resources to back up the attempt they're making is that their reputation will drop because they cannot fulfill the requests that are being sent to them. Yeah. Right, but the reputation is based on this agent advertises mask X. Do they fulfill requests effectively within that mask? So if you start off with a wide range on your mask 
and eventually all you've got are the five most popular blocks in the system because you've, you've gotten rid of everything, it's already overflowed, then if you get a request for anything other than those five most popular blocks, you won't be able to fulfill it. If, if you are performing the services that others are asking of you, your reputation won't drop. Your reputation is only based on, your reputation is, what does everyone else think of me? So for those, let's say, 80% of the requests you were able to answer, your reputation stays high. And then for those agents who are part of the 20% of the requests that you couldn't answer, your reputation drops a small fraction. Oh, you, you don't care. You just want to make money. It's, it's what service can you best fulfill in the system. Now, you're competing against other people who are trying to handle a large range of the address space. So it's a question of can you do it better than anyone else can. Yeah. How do we keep track of who's got how, who's got how much mojo? Right. Okay. Basically, again, it's coins. Your agent occasionally contacts the token server and says, "Is there anything new in my account? If so, withdraw the coins, please." Well, a token server. At the moment, it is the token server, but it will soon be one of many. And the token server is just something that signs little chunks of little tokens for you and withdraws an amount, an appropriate amount, from your your fixed account. At the moment, there is only one token server, which is the token server that we are running. But if, if there are more token servers, then there would be different currencies. That's like saying, you know, we mint, for example, dollars. Somebody else mints Deutschmark. Somebody else mints francs. They are, other parties can set up and say, I will exchange these one for another. But every set of tokens with, that is minted by a particular token server is its own separate currency. Yeah. User, is there any provision for an outside party to be able to limit a participant in the system? No. Wrap on, yeah, absolutely. In fact, it's real easy for anyone who has any access to any resource to resell it in our system. If it's behind a firewall, we don't care. If it's as long as it's available. It doesn't maintain a continuous connection. It maintains a state of the, the conversation. Okay. I send a message to you, you send a message to me, this is where we are. And then there's a relay server that's out there. So you're behind the firewall and I'm not. And the relay server here is advertising for your public key. I contact the relay server and you occasionally poll and say, give me the new messages. All over port 80. If they block port 80, you're screwed, but you know you can't really do much with the net if they do that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I really like the, the server side of the lazy on sort of the end user side. That's kind of 10 bucks. I don't want to for experience. Okay. Right. There's a client that we distribute that is our local broker and also a proxy. The proxy sits in your HTTP proxy path and can intercept our URLs and feed them off to the broker. And then the broker is your local agent that's running and reselling your disk space or your bandwidth or whatever. So this broker also has a publicly available API. Any other program can ask the broker, hey, I'd like a little bit of, of data. Here's where it is. So we can hook into anything on the back end. We just move bits from point A to point B. 
So yeah, it's really easy for anybody to decide, you know, I just want to, to resell this chunk of information and the client handles all of the, that for them. And that is distributed with the program. So many of my courses, they can do the search or the... For, yeah, for the content tracker, you pay them to get the result back. Exactly. And if you're starting off, it may be easier for you, for example, to donate content for us rather than ten dollars of Mojo will go a long, long way. I mean, we we have a, this currency right now. It's effectively nano cents is what we're talking about. About five nano cents because bandwidth is really the limiting factor right now. Disk space is free. CPU cycles you can't give them away. Right. Exactly, it, but bandwidth is still reasonably expensive, so that's what we're expecting to be the limiting factor. And a unit of Mojo is worth about five nanocents of T1 space right now. Yeah. Sure. Is a race to put you could be now initially there's the, the tipping function the pay Lars button so that is something that that's a service that we will run and if somebody wanted to donate to the registered publisher for a piece of block or for a particular file we'd collect the money for them if a third party comes in and says that royalty is for you know I'm the MPAA that's a Britney Spears MP3 that you've got, you're collecting a royalty for. You know, we should be handling that money. Fine. That's, I mean, the law is going to say that's what you got to do anyway. So what we're doing is we're just enabling that feature for them. We love the MPAA or the RIAA to jump in here and say, you know, you guys don't even know where Lars lives. We do. We can bill it. We can send him the, the, the check. We actually want to partner with these people to do, you know, to give them an alternative to what's out there. So but the only way the publisher makes money is the tip. So I, I downloaded years right. and I paid some bits. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right. Or perhaps you post something as a Britney Spears MP3, but instead it's a rant on, oh, you cheat people, you know. Why don't you actually pay the artist? And it's not. Right. So the mechanism that we use to control that are the reputations again. Pieces of information in the content. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, in that case, then, it, it's still a race. Remember that the content tracker has... It's like there may be 50 sites that match any particular lookup on AltaVista or Google. Who do you go to? Usually the first one listed or the second. You work your way down the list. In the same way the content tracker could return you a list of, here's something that matches your request, and this is the one that had the highest reputation from others as being the good cut, the one that you wanted. So basically the only way that we can get around that is by saying the first to publish will, will push a path in that direction. Their information will be distributed far and earlier than anyone else. So somebody who's coming in and trying to compete says, I have an MP3 with the same title, published later, hasn't been rated, versus an MP3 published a long time ago that's been rated by thousands of people. Which one are you going to use? If you want to use the new one, that's fine. We, we don't control the client at all. We let you do whatever you'd like to do. We just give you mechanisms for deciding how you want to make the choice. Well, no, it's a set amount of mojo. Again, every server within the system can set its own prices. You can say, then you're going to get millions of, let's say, let's say you decided to set your price to one. You'd get a million requests. How many of those do you think you could answer? Those that you couldn't sufficiently, that you couldn't actually answer, they're going to say, this person's a black hole. I send messages there, they don't even respond. Mark the reputation down. Exactly. This is, this is the market. This is how it works. Is you have the resources, you have the access, you lower your prices. I don't know who is the original creator of any digital content. Unless it was mine. I can't guarantee who was the creator. And we don't try to answer that question. All we do is we say, we can give the, the publisher a very cost-efficient way of publishing their data. You publish it once and you never have to pay again as long as it's popular. The other thing we offer is the tip. 
But it, it seems like this point is that if I'm a publisher, I publish it at 20 cents. I'm constantly damaging what I'm making 19. Oh, no, it's, as the publisher, you don't set a price. I, I'm sorry, I, 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 miss, I didn't make that clear, I guess. As a publisher, all you can do is put the data out there and hope people will buy. The other block servers are the ones that set the price, and this is their price for what I will charge you to deliver data. So, if, the, no. the originator of the content, remember, it's publisher anonymity. There's no way for us to even find out who the publisher was. All we can know is there's a set of blocks registered at this location by this publisher key as our, our kind of our royalty information. And if somebody comes in with a good court order saying this is really my bits, well, we'll change the reputation, the publisher listening to somebody else. But that's. Basically, that there is no exclusivity within the system. You, you cannot have an exclusive lock on a piece of information because as soon as you resell a copy, that person can resell it, and the next person can resell it, and they can resell it for a lot less than you're charging. So you're right. That's a problem. We decided don't even try to fix it. Just let it actually work for you. Yeah. Basically, until there is an actual registered publisher listed, you'd hit the tip button and it would try to find out who's listed as registered public. That registered publisher wouldn't find anyone and said, oops, well, I guess we can't give them a nickel. Maybe next time. Yes. Tipping is voluntary and optional. We think that people are honest. If they don't want to be honest, if they want to screw content publishers and not pay a tip ever, they can. Yeah. Um, with the content towards uh, being more and more available and more and more free, For starters, they, they won't actually have to pay real money. We'll give you some mojo to start off with. Um, initially, during the beta period, if you open up an account, we'll give you a million mojo just to have, to play around with, to, to actually use the system because we need to find out, you know, is this not going to break when we hit, you know, past 10,000 nodes or something. It's designed so it doesn't, but you, you never know. So what we're doing is we're giving people a little bit of mojo to get started, to throw content up there. Now, in the long term, you're right. The publisher says, what's in it for me? And basically, all we're saying is, we're a distribution system. If you'd like to use us to distribute your bits, you can. If you wouldn't like to use us to distribute your bits, maybe somebody else would like to use us to distribute your bits. But uh, you know, we don't. Uh, the publisher in this system is kind of the worst off, just because they don't get a big benefit. Unless you're somebody who wants to establish a reputation as being a great publisher of all of these goods. In which case, maybe you might be able to, at a later point, ask for more money. Say, sell your information to a content tracker. Jim's published some new stuff. I know that you're going to want it because you know you can resell it in a heartbeat. So maybe you'll pay me for that content information instead of me paying you. So just the, the content is, let's say, an MP3. Oh, what types of content? We can handle anything. Um, initially, you're going to find a lot of source code, a lot of images, um, music files. We can scale up to handle video, piece of cake, any piece of content you want. We just move it from place to place as efficiently as we can. And the system also, because it is lots of little pieces coming from a thousand nodes, it's really easy for us to share a, you know, a DivX file or an AVI or something that's four gigabytes in size because you're only asking for a small request from a million people rather than asking for one four gig file from one person. Yeah. Potentially. Um, it is it is efficient as a, a good backing store for your, your storage. Um, because it was a question of, is it a, a useful or efficient system for someone who just wants to publish their own data and potentially for data that changes rapidly? For example, like that system Right. Right. Because the way the Mojo Nation system is worked, the hashes of the file identify the pieces to it. Whenever you change one bit, the whole map is blown. We will be providing 
effectively a service that a namespace manager that will map a URL to here's the current Mojo Nation identifier for that so that you can actually publish mutable data within Mojo Nation. At the moment, yeah, when something changes, the references to it are blown. It is really something suitable for actual archival and storage of data that you want to distribute to others. Yeah. Right now, very little would do that except being a token service, we notice. But um, over time, you're right, what we'll do is we just won't give Mojo when you first start an account. And in fact, those who are starting in the system, when we go to the release and when it's Mojo backed by real dollars, what we're going to say is, we won't give you services in the system until you give a little bit to us first. You have to donate resources first. You have to earn your Mojo before you can spend it. So we, make, we might give you a nickel or a quarter, enough to, to work for an hour or so. But we will make it relatively difficult for somebody, somebody to basically smurf the server and get a thousand little bits that they bring back. So the bottom line would be, what that the market? Potentially, it will make it a little more difficult for people to use because they can't get instant gratification. What we're trying to do is give them a larger library of content that we can hold within the system and compelling reasons that they'd want to go specifically to Mojo Nation. If there are competing systems out there that can survive their own parasites and actually you know, grow up to handle this sort of content, then they would be a competitor and we'd have to figure out a way to potentially you know, beat them in the marketplace. But in the short term, yeah, we're just saying, toss out there, hopefully things won't break that horribly. Yeah. So, what the situation for you? We're in application to the NPA, and we're a lot of people. And I, I have a pretty serious dream I put out there. I think, uh, I post, I pay a question. Right. But in the end, I can still have my name and be able to do the same thing. Yes. Right? So, I'm in NPA now. Yes. The NPA has been very happy. I can kind of address this. But are you guys going to get a major thing into the end to be able to protect yourselves from them dying like so many services have? Because uh, the NPA is really, really, because I've made money off the NPA. I'm a really serious young company. Right. You could also be making money. Again, the tip doesn't specify what the tip is for. All it is is it's a payment. It's saying, give a nickel to Lars. It doesn't say why, it doesn't say what it's for. You just want to do it. So basically, all they can do is they can look at that and they can say, well, lots of people like Lars, but we don't know why. <laughs> um, so you end up with basically a situation where they can't match up the payments, and so they can come to us and say, we are United People, you're making a system that lets people earn money off of our stuff. My response to them is, well, if you can identify those blocks, we will do the honest thing and update it. But otherwise, maybe you should just beat them to the punch and distribute your data through our system. Oh, oh, I'm just, I missed you in the, the blue here. Yes, sorry. Well, yeah. Uh, I was wondering if uh, reputation is purely client local, or if those reputations can be public with local, such as some sort of rates. Like you were saying. Okay. They're, currently, they're all local. So the question is, are the reputations going to be all local, or will there be reputation systems that allow you to have more widespread? Will there be collections and aggregations of these? Is I think the question. Like when you, when you scan your um, response, you can say from Google or right. Android or whatever, you see the ones that are listed at the top, but they have reputation ratings next to them saying, yes, this one. Lots of people said this is good, or lots of people said this is Okay, I, it's, I think it's a question of how flexible is the reputation system. And it is as flexible as we can make it. All reputations are local. That's the only thing that you trust as gospel is what you have experienced out on the net. All other global reputations will actually just be guidelines. You'll say, I'll go to the Cisco and Ebert of Mojo Nation to find all this good video content. Okay, I trust them, so I'll pull down the reputations and maybe weight things appropriately, depending on the amount of trust I'm willing to give to this third party. But that's something that is of the choice. The local broker has the choice of how they want to do that. And these third-party services, the, the Cisco and Ebert, or these reputation services, 
will go around and actually try to pay people to give them a copy of their local reputation map and then collate them all together to build a global reputation. Yeah. Uh, so what is it exactly that the cost of publishers to publish? Say I have a terabyte of information that I want to publish. Um, how would I go about publishing it? How would I pay for it? And how would I register with you guys as a registered publisher or something? So basically, your the client's agent would handle all the publication tasks for you. It's like a it's a browser, it's a form you fill in. You just cruise through. You say, "This is the file I want to do," and upload it now. And so it'll take care of things. It'll find people to hold on to the blocks for you temporarily. If you run out of money halfway through the transaction, it'll say, "Oops, we have to get more." But you don't necessarily lose all the other activity you've done. In the same sense that as you're downloading, if you can't find enough people, well, you can stop, but you can always pick up the transaction where you happen to leave off. And if you wanted to publish a terabyte, the cost would actually, for something that large, would actually vary because the more you put in there, you're increasing the demand on the system, so the prices will slowly rise if people don't keep adding more supply. Um, I guess the second question, how would I register you? As a part of the publication agent, you can say there's there will be a little radio button saying, I am the publisher. I want to officially register as the publisher with the Mojo Nation royalty tracker, or I don't. You know, I, I don't want people to know that I was the guy who published this data, or at least that my public key was the identity that published this data. So that is a service that we will run. If any other agents, you know, anybody else out there wants to run a royalty tracker, they can. And if people go to look to them, power to it. But uh, yeah, basically, your client handles all of those functions for you. Well, we registered uh, in our royalty tracker, and then when people wanted to do a lookup and said, "Who is the person who published that cool bit of information?" Yeah. We have a, a DI, you register the hash of your, your info along with your public key. So they say, oh, I've, this was the information I had. I hash it up, I compare it. You were the cool guy who published this, so I'm going to send you a payment. And it's a payment directly to your public key ID. I don't know. It depends on if they can find you. If you're telling the world, I am this public key, yes. If you don't tell anyone that you're that public key, no, they can't find you unless they're really, really good. No. Okay, it's a question of what happens when all the world's governments come after us and say this is bad, or if they decide that the know your customer rules apply to us. We do know our customers, remember. We know the people who send us money, and we know the people that we send money to. The stuff that happens out in the Mojo market, we don't control it. We don't see most of it. We couldn't control it. So you're right. Parts, if, if a government agency, U.S. government agency, or if... WIPO or some other group goes after us, first they're going to have to deal with the fact that we're not operating as a U.S. company. So they're going to have to trot on over to the Cayman Islands and shut us down there. Then they're going to have to shut down any of the other token servers that might exist out in the system. And this, these are small boxes. Part of the, the design for the system was that all of the good bandwidth in the world is here in the U.S., in Europe, places that have really nasty jurisdictions for some of this stuff. The places that have interesting jurisdictions don't have any connectivity. It's expensive, it's unreliable. We separate the data from the metadata needed to reconstruct it. So you can move trackers and, and some of these meta service functions offshore to any place on the net that exists. 
in a friendly jurisdiction and conduct the transactions there because they're small chunks of information. All of the big data is sitting in the US or Europe on people with fiber optic lines and, and well connected and cheaply. So we try to split the two up to get around some of those problems. And the other is we set the company up so that hopefully they can't get away with that. Is somebody trying to do money laundering or move ta other things through it? Right. Services for who? Basically, if they're willing to pay more than you are, they're going to get the service. So what they're doing, it's sort of a denial of service attack on, say, Twinkies by going around town and buying up all of the Twinkies and saying, aha, I showed hostess. They're never going to be able to, to get another Twinkie move through this town. What happens is all they're doing is they're paying you to accept this sort of denial of service attack. What happens is this third party agency, say a government agency or a corporate entity, buys up a lot of mojo and then goes out and buys services. So they raise demand. So now it's worth your time and money to attach another disk to the system or fire up another server because you're going to start earning some real money because there's some big spenders on the net who are willing to pay anything to make sure no one else gets a transaction through. Yeah, $50, exactly. I mean, basically, the system will try to correct itself using those market mechanisms where if you try to go out and buy all the services, all you're going to do is raise the price. And there may be people who are willing to pay more for a small chunk of services than those other agencies can afford to buy up all of the capacity of the system. Definite possibility. Um, one th it's, it's a question of uh, sort of a digital divide question. You have a system that is skewed a little bit towards people who have high bandwidth connections in terms of the amount of mojo they can earn and the type of content that they can see. So those who are unable to afford some of the higher content data, the question is, are we locking them out? And I'd hope not. Part of what we're saying is, Anybody who can participate in the system, so if you have the resources to download data, then by definition, you have the resources to sell services to the system. You obviously have an internet connection, you obviously have a CPU, and you've got a disk, maybe small, maybe not. So what it is is that you are offering this to the system a chunk of services, and in return, you'll be able to get what you contribute to the system. So you're right, we don't make it, we don't solve the fact that there are some people who can pay for better services than others, but those who can't necessarily pay for them can do things like say, I'll run this for five days to earn a lot of mojo so that I can do a very multimedia rich transaction on you know, the sixth day. It also works across international boundaries. So if you're somebody sitting in an interesting jurisdiction, you can resell that fact. Hi, I have a tracker sitting in the Netherlands. Pay a little bit more for me. Right. So what you can do is that you can pay for a credit rate by buying a bunch of accounts and moving money through one of those accounts. You know, the credit rating is, is a, a representation of your flow through the bank. So basically it's a question of how much do you have invested in the system so far. And you're right, it doesn't completely solve the problem of people who might want to, to game the system. And there are lots of different games that people can play, just like any other economy out there. There are con games, there are swindles. We just try to make it so that if you attempt to pull off a trick like that in the system, 
by the time you've gotten to the position where enough people trust you, you will have already performed some service for the system. So we've at least gotten something out of you in the first place. Oh, to, to recycle the same funds through an account to drive up the credit rating. That would give you an impression of flow, but it wouldn't give you any history in any other tasks. So, you're right, you could artificially try to boost your credit rating. And you know, we can make, there are different alternatives we have to, to fix that on the bank side as well. Charging you for certain activities and that sort of thing. We already charge right now basically a small number based on the, the amount of coins that you have assigned because that's all it costs. Every signature costs us a few cycles of CPU time and some heat. So we charge you according to the number of coins you withdraw. Now, beyond that, we're basically going to try to use market-based mechanisms to enforce it. So either play games with pricing or play reputation games. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, we don't try to prevent fraud. In fact, we go, at certain points, we do things specifically to allow a type of fraud because we want to relax other assumptions, like the need to know an identity or the need to be able to trace a, and audit a transaction. What we're trying to do is bring fraud to a level where it can be controlled and people can know ahead of time, well, I'll probably get this much out of it. Maybe I'll lose, you know, 2% due to fraud costs in general. That's, an ex that's a cost I'm willing to pay. And then the market just adjusts accordingly. Yeah. Well, technically, we're not minting a currency. Our lawyers think that we will qualify as a non-bank financial institution, which means that there are certain hoops that we have to jump through. But, but we're not actually minting legal tender. The old Civil War laws about that they used to consolidate down to greenbacks that will not cover us. We're like the casinos. You walk into a casino, you buy chips, you go to the poker table, you play poker with other people, at the end of the day, you go back and you cash out your chips. We're the casino. All it is is it's a token. It doesn't mean anything. In fact, the dollar value is not fixed. It's just this token is worth whatever you can get somebody else to do for you if they accept the token.
is one denomination mojo, there is one coin, I think it's 10,000 mojo coin, just for simplicity's sake. Over the long term, we will have multiple denominations of the coin and we will most likely accept multiple competing currencies within the system. What we're more concerned about right now is actually establishing one currency that works. After that, people are welcome to set up whatever they want. As far as how big can we scale up to, or right now, today, how much data could you throw on there? A couple terabytes. Right now, this is just, we will provide servers to back the currency, as it were. So we will be the redeemer of last resort. Therefore, we have to keep some block servers, we have to keep some trackers and other servers, well, meta trackers, but trackers of trackers running that sort of thing. For those services, we will sell some of our disk space, and we've got a couple of terabyte waiting for stuff, and when more people join in and start running these on their always connected computers, the pool just keeps getting larger and larger in terms of the resources available. So, like any system that's d distributed and emergent like this, when it starts off, it's a little fragile. But as the system grows, we can accept more and more agents disconnecting and reconnecting from the system, and everything just continues on as if nothing happened. Steve's telling me it's time to stop. <laughs> so, ah, oh yeah, sorry. The other thing is that we've got swag here for anyone who's stuck around this long. Free t-shirts somewhere over here inside. Score your, score your shirts.